We are approaching the end of Exodus chapter 16. So I think of our reading of verse 22. Just to remind you, the Israelites wandered out into the wilderness and were without food. And they grew very upset. The grumbling on the part of the Israelites was widespread throughout the whole congregation. Uh, and they came and they were ready for anyone who represented God. So Moses and Aaron uh, were the objects of their grumbling. But God heard their grumbling, and rather than disciplining them, rather than punishing them for their sinfulness, for the outrageous things they were saying in view of their frustration and anger, uh, God instead shows His grace. And one can think of how Moses and Aaron instructed Israel to go look into the wilderness and see the glory of the Lord. Later on, Moses himself will ask that God would show him his glory. And uh, the, the Lord would appear before him and show that he was a God who was loving, compassionate, and gracious. Here is one example of that where he provides his people with food. He provides them with quail in the evening and manna every morning. So every morning people of Israel would go out into the wilderness area gather what had fallen through the night and bring it together. There was enough for each day once a day for each person meeting their full needs. I'm tempted to continue preaching in that older section but we need to move on. Looking at verse 22 then, we continue the narrative. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink. There were no worms in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations, so that they may see the bread which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it, and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The people of Israel ate the manna forty years, so they came to a, to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is the tenth part of an ephah. That's correct. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and for the gracious provision you make for us, for our growth in grace, and for our knowledge of Christ. We pray that you would bless our meditation on your word this morning. 
May your spirit prepare our hearts to receive your word, and we pray that you grant us grace to know you and follow you more fully, more perfectly, uh, to your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I opened up my edition of First Things Magazine and read an article by a Jewish professor by the name of Shalom Karmi. He's a professor at Yeshiva University, which is in Israel, I think Tel Aviv, but I'm not certain of that. At any rate, he's a philosopher. And he writes about the uh, struggle that he, he has as a Jew and as a philosopher to reconcile the command to believe on the part of the Jewish faith and the skepticism required of a philosopher to doubt and question everything. He thinks about his history in philosophy and how Socrates was one who questioned everything, so much so that the Athenians grew weary of his questioning and decided to give him a little bit of hemlock for his trouble. And he passed on. Later, you have in introductory courses to modern philosophy, a reading from René Descartes. And Descartes was one who also questioned everything. He doubted everything so that he could find the one thing that he could really believe to be true. And he came up with this famous uh, dictum, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And so Descartes questioned everything and then really focused everything on himself and tried to build a world, build an understanding of things on the basis of his own rationality or personality. So Carby struggles with the relationship between the function of the philosopher and examining uh, things and trying to be doubtful of everything until you find a nugget of truth on the one hand, and then you have, as a, a Jewish person, the call to faith, to trust in the Lord. And it's very difficult for him to maintain a balance between the two. As he goes along in this essay, he reports on a story written by a, a friend of his, by the name of Hayem Badir who talks about his father's unbelief. Though raised in an Orthodox Jewish family and trained in uh, all the laws and rituals of the Jewish faith, uh, he lost his faith in God because under the Nazi uh, regime, his brother was murdered. And he struggled with how God could allow such a thing to happen. And so he didn't believe in God. But nonetheless, he kept up the moral traditions of the Jewish faith. He observed Shabbat, Sabbath, on the seventh day of the week, and uh, tried to follow the various requirements for that. His son, which was Chaim Ba'ir, noted that his father was a little bit inconsistent in his observance of the Shabbat, the Sabbath. Uh, he would not, although he very much enjoyed uh, the uh, classical music and, and the Cantons singing, uh, he would not celebrate that on Shabbat, on the Sabbath, because that violated it. But he had a neighbor, perhaps not so observant, who would play the music for him at a louder pace so he could hear it coming over from the, from the neighbor. And to reward the neighbor, the neighbor would frequent his business and would give him a little something extra for his efforts. And so the son, Chaim, asked his father, what is this inconsistency? First, you don't believe in God, but you observe the moral laws of, of, of Judaism. Why? And then second, as you keep these moral laws, you contradict yourself by stepping into the classical world and hearing all this music from your neighbor. And Chaim was having his own struggles with belief at this point as well. Well, his father said, let's 
sit down and read from the Torah. They sit down and read from it, and it talks about what is possible on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath day. If a house is burning, what are you able to take from the house? The answer was two meals. I said, two meals. Because when you take those things from your house, you're going to need to survive on them for this day and the next day as well. And that was the title of his essay, Two Meals. And his idea was basically we, we kind of step in two worlds, and we don't know about God anymore, but we continue at least being moral people, and we kind of indulge in philosophy and unbelief and these kinds of things as well. So there is this tension within Shalom Karmi's life and towards the end of a career he's writing of this. I was curious by the, at, at this essay because of the idea of two meals. And for Karmi, it seems to me these two meals are really not very satisfying. Because it really does not bring you into relationship with God, and fellowship with Him, and belief in Him. It's rather, I don't know about God whether He's there or not, but I'll obey, and maybe in along the way as I obey, maybe God will reveal Himself to me, I don't know. And then I also got to deal with my public life as a philosopher, which questions everything. A very unsatisfying pair of meals, it seems to me. Maybe two Twinkies. <laughs> Tasty in some ways, but not very satisfying. God provides his people two meals on the sixth day of the week. As they went out during the, the week to collect the manna, they observed day after day that as they gathered enough manna for each individual person, and by the way, I didn't get to say this last week, it seems to me that the idea that the manna comes for each person gives them enough for what they need for one day, our daily bread, points us to Christ and how Christ is sufficient for us. We must have the whole Christ to satisfy us for each day. Not just a portion or not just part of him and something else as well. We feed on Christ each day. He is our bread of life. And so we draw near to him in fellowship and walk with Him by faith, and we are strengthened by union with Christ, day by day. But for the Jews, they only had enough for one day. And that kind of reminds us of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, take no worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough troubles of its own. You know, commit your, your cares to the Lord for this day. Think about this one day. And that's what we need to do. And so that was being impressed upon Israel for five days a week. The sixth day, they had an abundance. A great amount of manna was gathered, twice what they needed. Now it seems like the leaders of the Jews were concerned about this. They were afraid that they gathered too much, that it's going to spoil and rot, just as it did for some of the folks on the first five days of the week. And so therefore they come running to Moses. Now if you go back into the previous section there, the Lord had spoken to Moses about what was to be done, but the Jews were not especially told that on the sixth day they would have double what they would need so that they could rest on the Sabbath day. So the leaders are a little bit confused here, and Moses assures them that this is what the Lord said. We've got a twice as much on the sixth day so that on the seventh day you can rest completely and eat off of that. Both meals, two meals. And furthermore, that second meal on the sixth day will be okay on the seventh day. You'll be able to eat it without it corrupt, being corrupted, spoiled. Now there's some question as to the, how that is preserved. Some think that the text here speaks of you know, what you boil, you boil, what you bake, you bake, and what's left over you keep for Sunday. And so the idea is that the boiling and the baking of, of the, the manna is what preserved the bread for the next day. Preserved the manna for the next day. Uh, 
that may be possible, it may also be possible that they eat what they eat on the sixth day, and then the man that's left over, just by God's grace, is sustained for the seventh day. So there was a continuing miracle among the people. Not only with the provision of food for each day, but now on the sixth day, going into the seventh day, they continued to be healthy as opposed to the rest of the week. Two meals then on the sixth day, so that on the seventh day, Israel could rest. Now, this is the first time, from what I'm told, and I didn't get my concordance out to check it, but this is the first time that the word Sabbath is used in Scripture. A day of rest. Now, it seems that the idea of Sabbath was uh, already current within Israel, or at least for Moses, although they may not have been observing it up until this point. When they were slaves in Egypt under Pharaoh, there was no Sabbath, there was no day of rest. They might have had a rest here and a rest there, but there was no regular pattern of a day of rest for Israel. And so you recall last week we saw that Israel on the one hand was comparing the Lord to Pharaoh and saying when we were under Pharaoh we had pots of meat and we had bread every morning, we had all this stuff. Later on they'll talk about leeks and garlic and all kinds of stuff. But with the Lord, we're starving out here in the wilderness. But now God shows his generosity to his people by providing for them each day all that they need, twice on the sixth day, so they wouldn't have to work on the seventh day. So now God has given them a day of rest, a regular day, when the whole community rests together. Isn't that so much better than having kind of a rotating schedule where one day you're off and then the next day you're... And so the husband's off on Tuesday, the wife is off on Friday, and then they're working at different points during the rest of the week, including the weekends and that kind of thing. I dealt with that in retail. Um, because you, you're required, required, required to work on Sunday. I was able to uh, get out of that by my religious faith and my uh, commitments. So I did not work on Sundays on the whole. Um, but you have here God's gracious provision for his people as compared to Pharaoh and the bondage that Pharaoh provided. And so if we have a situation where everyone, the whole community, is off on one day, that's an opportunity for families to be together, spend time together, and talk. It's a great opportunity now in this new covenant age for God's people to gather together all on one day to worship the Lord, not have some out working uh, or uh, taking part in sports, as I've seen here in our local community. I remember driving here years ago uh, with my parents from their home in Hatboro and coming up and seeing the sports fields filled with kids running around playing soccer and baseball and things like that on a Sunday morning when they should be going to church. There's this new idol in the world today of sports and thinking that that is the way to life, joy, and salvation. In any case, God provides for his people a day of rest, a Shabbat. Now the quality of this day of rest is not simply a ceasing of all activity, although there, there's a good deal of that. You note that um, Israel was to stay at home. They were not to go out into the fields and look for the manna. They were not, in other words, to labor at that which provided them with bread. They were to put those uh, requirements to the side on the Sabbath day. They were to rest. They were even to stay in their homes or in their place at that time. I'm not sure if that meant that they had like a, a tent for each family or uh, something to that effect that they stayed together or just simply that the whole congregation was to stay where they were at and not go outside the congregation out into the fields or out into the wilderness to find more manna. In any case, they were to rest and to stay at home. And so God 
provides his people with rest. Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. It has a healing feature to it. It's given to us for our benefit, for our well-being. Uh, after laboring hard through the week, it's great to be able to relax, put these other activities to the side, and focus on other things. But Moses says more. He says it is to be a, a holy Sabbath, a, a, a day to the Lord, a Sabbath to the Lord. And while you don't have a full-blown description of all that takes place on the Sabbath here, that's going to continue to come as we go on even into the New Testament, uh, you do note that the day is holy. And you're reminded of how holiness marked the presence of God among his people. Moses, when he went on the mountain at the very beginning in Exodus 3, approached the burning bush and he was told to take off the sandals from his feet for the ground on which he was standing was holy ground. It was holy not because of that particular bush or that location, but because of the presence of the Lord there. And so the Sabbath is a place where God dwells with his people. A place where God reveals himself in a unique way to his people. It's a Sabbath. I think of the words of Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah 58 verse 13, where he urges the people of his day, as we uh, read from that at the call to worship this morning, uh, you can read it in your bulletin there, where uh, Isaiah says that if you turn your foot from the Sabbath and call my day of delight, the holy of the Lord, and that idea of turning your foot from the Sabbath doesn't mean you, you don't observe the Sabbath, what it means is that uh, the Sabbath is a holy day. And rather than profaning the day by just trampling over it like any other day of the week, without any regard for it being a different day, uh, no, Isaiah urged the Israelites to stop. Stop just trampling the Sabbath. Observe it as a unique and holy day to the Lord. And as you do so, you will delight in the Lord. He will make you to ride on the heights of the earth. He will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. Uh, all uh, symbols of God's blessing, his spiritual blessings on his people as they draw near to him on the Sabbath day. So, God gives his people the Sabbath and they are to observe it and it's not something that's entirely new, it seems to me, because you have the Sabbath given at the creation. And then, uh, shortly, God will reveal the Sabbath at Mount Sinai as part of the Ten Commandments. It is to be a day of rest. So, you have this old covenant situation where God's people were to set aside the seventh day to worship the Lord. It was to be a holy day where the presence of God was evident to the people of God. When we come into the New Testament, the question becomes, does this Sabbath, this Old Testament observance, continue into the church in the New Covenant age? And some will question that. They'll say, well, first of all, you have the Jewish observance of the Sabbath ongoing in the midst of the establishment of the Christian church. And Paul would go into the Jewish synagogues on the Sabbath and reason from the scriptures with the, the folks there. But then he would have a separate day, the Lord's Day, for the church. And the church would gather on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. And so therefore the thought is that, well, the Lord's Day is different from the Jewish Sabbath. And the Jewish Sabbath was a part of the Old Covenant types and symbols and shadows and things that are passing away. And in the New Covenant age, we have something called the Lord's Day. And it's a day when Christians gather together, they hear the Word of God, they have fellowship with each other. But it's not quite the same as the Old Covenant Sabbath. And then, now, mind you, this was a, a view of Calvin leading on into the, the uh, 
uh, Dutch Reformed tradition, what's called the Continental View of the Sabbath. And you might even then go to Colossians chapter 2, where Paul urges the church there not to allow themselves to be bound by such requirements as to uh, observe uh, uh, restrictions against food and drink, uh, to observe uh, festival days, religious festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths. So in Colossians chapter 2, Paul says, you're not to be bound by Sabbaths. And so is he saying, therefore, that the Lord's Day is not a Christian Sabbath, that there's not this transfer of the Sabbath under the Old Covenant to the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, for the church. Well, certainly, the, the Christian church was not required to observe the Jewish Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. Those Sabbaths, indeed, come to a close. They are fulfilled with the coming of Christ. But what is more, when you look at particularly Colossians chapter 2, where Paul talks about various rituals that we are not to have ourselves bound to, you'll note that the Sabbaths here come in the context of ceremonial aspects of the Jewish law, of the law of Moses. Dietary laws, what we were to eat and drink. Uh, special festivals. You recall in Leviticus 23, there are several, three or four festivals that the, the Jews were to assemble in Jerusalem, eventually in Jerusalem, and that was to be a special Sabbath. Uh, the Day of Atonement was a Sabbath, even though it might not fall on the seventh day of the week, it nonetheless would be a Sabbath day. And so there were various rituals under the Old Testament that were part of the ceremonial aspects of the law, and they themselves would indeed fall away. And so it seems to me that what Paul is talking about there, when he references Sabbaths in Colossians 2, is not the Sabbath of the moral law given in the Ten Commandments, which after all was grounded in the creation account, and the moral order that God placed upon all of creation to imitate Him in working six days and resting on the seventh. But the, the Sabbath that Paul speaks of are these ritual, ceremonial types of Sabbaths that the Jews were requiring, Jewish believers might have been requiring observance of in order to be a good, faithful believer, along with other rituals that they insisted on, like circumcision. And further evidence for that is found in the next verse where Paul talks about these things and describes all of them as shadows of the greatest things to come. And so Paul describes the, the new moons, the, the religious festivals, and the Sabbaths as shadows of the greater things to come in Christ. And this term shadow, again, speaks of the ceremonial aspects of the law of God. We don't speak of the Ten Commandments as a shadow of the good things to come, as though the Ten Commandments passed away. We recognize that idolatry is evil for all of mankind, for all time. Uh, adultery, murder, theft, false witness, all these things are evil for all people, for all time. That's God's moral law. So also the Sabbath is required of all people for all time. But it does undergo a change of day from the seventh to the first day in view of the fulfillment of our salvation and the resurrection of Christ and the new age, the new creation that he's bringing about. And so within the uh, Presbyterian tradition, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the, the old uh, tradition coming from the Westminster Standards, uh, which was uh, about 100 years after Calvin, um, the uh, church has recognized that the Lord's Day is a Christian Sabbath, a day of rest. Now, that's a day for worship, as our Confession and larger catechism especially details a day of worship to be given over to the worship of the Lord uh, 
It's a day of rest from other employments, even recreations are to be put aside. And it's a day when we are to enjoy the Lord, have fellowship with Him. And it's a day when acts of necessity and mercy may also be pursued. Jesus walking through the grain fields, and the disciples pick the grains. The Pharisees say, what are you, your disciples doing? They're working. And Jesus says, no, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. David went into the, the temple and ate of the, the food there, though it was restricted against him. And God blessed him. There are provisions for uh, things that can and should be done on the Sabbath day. But the day is to be set aside for the Lord. And so Moses uh, explains to the elders that the two meals are to be set aside, one for the Sabbath day, and they are to rest. And then the manna was to be placed into a jar and held as a testimony for the generations to come. Now Moses is going to say that God provided for his people through the 40 years of the wilderness wanderings until the time they enter into the land of Canaan. Then they will eat off the land there and no longer be required to eat off of the, the, the manna from the wilderness. So it was a temporary thing to sustain them in this wilderness wanderings. The New Testament describes our Christian experience as a time of being in the wilderness. We are wandering in this period of time and God's provision for us in Christ is sufficient for each day right through the end of our experience in this world. Until we finally enter into Canaan New heavens and new earth, where God's blessings will go far beyond what we experience here. We have the blessings of heaven now, but not yet, not in their fullness. And so this memorial was to be placed aside as a witness or a testimony to Israel for generations to come of how God's provided for his people. And this manna, two quarts of manna, would last not only for the sixth day and the seventh day, but for year after year after year as a testimony to Israel of God's faithfulness and his provision for his people. We can look at that and know that God provides for us. First, as Jesus reminds the disciples in Matthew 6, uh, God, will, God knows what we need, will provide us with our food, drink, and clothing, our shelter. He provides us with these things as we seek first his kingdom and righteousness. And so we trust in him to provide for these earthly things. We pray for our daily bread, and that's for real physical food, because we need something to eat. But ultimately, God's provision for us is in Christ and the salvation in him, the blessings of salvation, the forgiveness of sins, righteousness of Christ, peace with God, everlasting life, the joy of the Holy Spirit's presence, the communion with God, prayers to God, all these things are ours in Christ. And they sustain us in this life until we finally enter into glory, into the eternal Sabbath. And all this because in a house in a place called Bethlehem, which means house of bread. The bread of life appeared and has come to feed us so that we might live forever. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word and pray that your spirit would bless it to our hearts. We pray that the testimony of your provision for your people in Christ would be a comfort and an encouragement to us in our days of stress and trial, as well as comfort and joy, we pray that you would help us evermore to rest in Christ and to be joined to him. We pray in his name.